He died for me. Yes, he did it. He died for me. Oh, yeah. He died for me. He saved my soul. He made me whole. He picked me up. He turned me around. He died for me. I'm so glad he did it. Yes, he did it. your testimony I dare you to stand up on your feet and give God praise this is the day that the Lord has made we've come to rejoice and be glad in it we've come to lift up the name of Jesus the one who died for all of our sins we've come to lift up Jesus the one who died once for all we've come to lift up the name of Jesus that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We come to lift up the name of Jesus, the one who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. I dare you to open up your mouth, throw your head back, and say he dies for me. This is your call to worship. Now open up your mouth and give God praise. Hallelujah. Our scripture reading is coming from Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 32 through 44. The New International Version renders the text this way. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now 
if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. This ends the reading of the word of God. Please remain standing for our hymn this morning, this afternoon, nothing but the blood. Come on, let's sing. What can, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm singing, oh, precious is the blood of Oh, 
prayer posture, you may be seated as we go before the throne of grace. Aren't you glad it was nothing but the blood of Jesus that justified, sanctified, and saved you? Amen. If every heart would pray as we talk to our Lord and Savior. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you on this afternoon fully submitted and surrendered to your will and to your way as we sit on the intersection of the Garden of Gethsemane and Resurrection Sunday. In order to get to Resurrection Sunday, we first have to go to Calvary. And as much as we don't like the idea of suffering, we know and we thank you, God, that it was your character to suffer. We thank you, Jesus, that you suffered the anguish and the agony of the cross. Thank you, God, that even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when you asked God to remove the cup from you, you had the character to deny yourself and to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so God, on today, even as your children are assembled here together to give your name all the glory, the honor, and the praise, that we acknowledge that if we're gonna be your disciples, if we are your children, if we're gonna reflect the character and the mind of Christ, that there are simply some things in our life that have to die. So we ask God in the name of Jesus that even as this worship service goes forth, that you would shine a light on our hearts and in our minds, that we would have a transparent moment with you. And we would ask that you would show us what is it that's within us that simply has to die. Maybe it's some relationships that need to die. Maybe it's some thoughts that we have that we're not good enough, that we're not strong enough, that we don't have what it takes to do what you've called us to do. Maybe that simply just has to die. We ask that you would crucify the flesh, God, as we walk this road to Resurrection Sunday with you, that we have full confidence that you will do a complete work in us because God, you are transrational. that even in dead situations, you can bring forth life. And so we thank you, God, for your restorative power. We thank you, God, for your power that heals, sets, frees, and delivers because we know that Sunday is coming. So even as we die to the flesh, and even as we die to our spirits, even as we say yes to your will and yes to your way, God, we know that you're gonna do a supernatural work in us. And we're walking this road with you that even as you died, you gave us life, eternal and abundant life. And for that, we come to say thank you, Jesus. We pray that you would anoint the preacher, God, that you anoint Dr. Anderson in the name of Jesus, that even as he does surgery, we'll receive what you have in store for us. Thank you, God, this isn't for ritual or tradition or something to do on a Friday afternoon, but we've come here to remind you just how much we love you because, God, you sent your only begotten son to suffer for us, who died for us, but who also live that we may have a right to eternal life. Be glorified in this worship experience, God. We surrender to your will and to your way. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen, amen, and amen.
the cross thank God for the finished work that was done at the cross yes Lord how we honor the Lord for the cross today what a joy it is to be here in the Lord's house with the Lord's people on the Lord's day how we thank God for each and every one of you who has made your way to Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church on this good Friday afternoon we thank God for those who are viewing all around the world. God bless you one and all. Thank you for taking the time to be a part of our experience of worship. Each year we gather at this noon hour to remember that from the sixth to the ninth hour, Jesus Christ hung on a cross and secured our salvation. And so today we come at this sixth hour to celebrate the work of Jesus Christ that was wrought at Calvary to secure our salvation, saving us from our sins. To God be the glory. And how we thank God for Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church and the sister congregation that joins her today, the Lily Grove Baptist Church. Come on and thank God for these two sister congregations. Amen. Amen. It's a joy to have you back, Lily Grove. We're delighted that you have come all this way. I know you had to stop for lunch and for gas a couple times on the way, but thank you so much for making it all the way down Scott Street, amen, to be a part of our experience of Good Friday worship today. And how we thank God for her pastor who is here with them, the Reverend Terry Keith Anderson, there's nobody like him, and we thank God for him. Last week, last week, the Lily Grove Church celebrated 64 years as a church family. 
Amen. Wheeler Avenue, we were, we were invited to share with them in that celebration, but because we were uh, in traveling, we weren't able to be with them, but I'm so grateful that he extended the invitation to us to come again uh, last year, uh, last week rather, to come and share with them uh, as they celebrated 64 years. We, are right, we always remind them they're our big sister church. We will turn 62 later this year, and we thank God for these six plus decades that both of these churches have been serving in this community. For 33 of those years, Pastor Anderson has been their pastor, and we thank God for those 33 years. Amen. 33 years. And what a blessing he has been to them, and what a blessing that church is to so many around the world. And we thank God that we have the fellowship that we share each and every Good Friday as he comes, as they come to share with us in this worship experience. And that's my presentation of him. He is going to come and preach the word of God to us today. He needs no introduction at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, but I just wanted you uh, to again be made aware of the delightful service that he has rendered to them for these 33 years as they uh, six, at 64 years have served this, con this community as a congregation. We're going to give unto the Lord this afternoon, and as we get ready to give, I do want to at least acknowledge those who are not members of either Wheeler Avenue or Lily Grove. If you're here and you're a member of other congregations, just wave at us. You're not a member of Lily Grove or Wheeler Avenue. All right, praise the Lord. I almost said, why not? But I'm not gonna ask that question. I'm just playing a little bit. And so I want to thank God for <laughs> For all of our other congregations who have joined with us this afternoon, God bless you. Welcome to Wheeler Avenue. We're all family today. And when we come to Good Friday service, there's no distinction between one congregation or another. All of us who have been baptized, born again, blood-bought believers get happy about Good Friday afternoon because he died to take our place. And so let's give unto the Lord. It's offering time in the Lord's church, and we're excited about giving. And we thank God for the privilege of doing so. Many of you are able to give online, and so we show to you on the screens all of the digital platforms that are available to us. Others of us are able to give uh, or prefer to give uh, through these tangible methods uh, by giving in envelopes, and so our ushers are passing through the aisles now, and if you need an envelope, they will make one available to you, and we invite you to utilize their ministry of these envelopes and then the drop boxes along the walls of the church are available to you to deposit those gifts once the benediction has been has been provided as we give this afternoon we are grateful that God has blessed us with yet another opportunity to give anytime God gives us an opportunity we ought to take full advantage of it because we recognize that we only have something to give because God keeps giving to us and we thank God that he keeps giving to us hey Samika we thank God that he keeps giving to us and we are grateful that we have the opportunity to return to God pardon, pardon me a portion of what God has given to us so as we give this afternoon we do so joyfully and cheerfully because the Bible declares that God loves a cheerful giver so as you're preparing your gifts I know some of you are still receiving envelopes and I don't want to rush that process once you have received your envelope or you have prepared your digital presentation, let's now consecrate these gifts in prayer as we go before our holy God. Let's pray. Gracious God, how we love you and praise you and thank you for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Thank you for the gift of life and especially today the gift of life everlasting. We thank you for the opportunity to give because you have shown us by continual example what it means to give and give and give even the more. And so today as we give our gifts unto you, we thank you that you have, first of all, blessed us with something to give. And now as we return these gifts to you, we pray that you will bless them, that you will consecrate them to your use, then multiply them, that they might do exponentially more than we would have ever imagined had we withheld them and kept them to ourselves. Bless each gift and each giver. Let no one lack as a consequence of what they give this afternoon. But will you return to your sons and daughters as you see fit so that each of us will continually have the testimony of our elders that we can't beat God giving no matter how we try. 
we thank you for victory in our finances and I pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people who agree shout hallelujah let the church say amen amen let's give unto our God in just a few seconds the Little Grove Missionary Baptist Church Choir is going to bless us again with music ministry as they prepare us for the Word of God but I want to thank God for these sisters who before the call to worship blessed us with the violin and the piano. Will you thank God for Stephanie and for Jamie? I don't know where they are, but they're back there somewhere. We have some amazing musicians at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, as is the case at Lily Grove. But I'm grateful uh, that one of the things that we can always celebrate uh, is the gift of these who are not traditional Baptist church musicians in the sense that you would sometimes think uh, we got a sister on the violin who just loves the Lord and loves to play for the glory of God God bless you Jamie and we've got a sister who's been ministering on the piano for so long and blessing so many and we thank God for Stephanie the intergenerational sisters on the instruments today and we thank God for them. Thank you, Minister Lewis, for your leadership. There's Stephanie. Hey, sis. God bless you. Thank you for everything that you do and for the music that you make. And Jamie, thank you for as well. And now as we prepare to hear uh, from the ministry of Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church, won't you center yourselves, prepare yourselves for the next hour is going to be an awesome and amazing experience as we receive both music and the message from the Lily Grove Missionary Baptist Church under the leadership of Pastor T.K. Anderson. Receive them all with joy. Oh, 
sorrow Hope for my tomorrow Peace in the time of storm Strength when I'm weak and poor I can never repay you, Lord For what you've done for me How you lose my shackles and you set me free How you made a way out of no way Turn my darkness into day You've been my joy in the time of sorrow
Cosby and to Reverends Washington and Alexander and to the Reverend Clergy, Deacons of Wheeler Avenue and Deacons of Lily Grove, and all of you, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are grateful again. We are grateful again to, to come among you to share my feeble preaching but my strong convictions about our Lord and his Christ. Thank you, Lily Grove, for traversing the dangerous highways <laughs> to come up here to Wheeler Avenue Church. We are always, always Glad to be here to fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I was thinking about it on the way here, that Lily Grove and Wheeler are so close in proximity that we ought to merge these two churches together <laughs> and I would be the pastor. Reverend Cosby could direct the choir. I think the Lord would be pleased with that, don't you? But again, we are grateful for the fellowship of the Lily Avenue Baptist Church. Thank you so much for your being here. All of you who have joined us online, welcome to this fellowship today. This is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. There is a word I want to lift in your hearing found in Matthew at chapter 27, verse 35. Can y'all make me a little brighter on that camera, please, if you can? Uh, <laughs> I ain't that black. Matthew at chapter 27, verse number 35 from the New Living Translation. <clears throat> After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Thank you, you may be seated. <clears throat> the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God shall stand forever. After they had nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. I want to talk this afternoon from this subject, close to the cross, but far from the blood. Close to the cross, but far from the blood. Crucifixion as a form of execution probably originated with the Persians. The practice was picked up by the Carthaginians and later appropriated in Greece by Alexander the Great, adopted by the Romans and 
finally abolished by Emperor Constantine. It is estimated that by the time of Christ, 30,000 men in Israel alone had been crucified primarily for insurrection. Crucifixion was more than the utmost in humiliation and shame. It was an ugly business. And the mercy of suddenness was denied the person condemned to die. For it was this slow torture which made death on the cross a fiendish and ugly method of execution. It seemed to include all that pain and death can have of the horrible and ghastly dizziness, cramps, thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, traumatic fever, shame, long continuance of torment, horror of anticipation, mortification of intended wounds, stopping just short of giving the sufferer relief by rendering him unconscious. The unnatural position made every movement painful. The lacerated veins and crushed tendons throbbed with incessant anguish. Can you feel it? If the victim took several days to die, which was often the case, the wounds inflamed by exposure gradually turned gangrenous. The arteries became swollen and oppressed with surcharged blood. As the arms fatigue, cramps knot the muscles in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. Can you feel it? The pectoral muscles are paralyzed and the intercostal muscles are unable to act. Air can be inhaled but not exhaled. Can you feel it? Carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream. There is a deep crushing pain in the chest as the pericardium slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. Death comes by slow exhaustion while the heat of the sun saps the strength, thirst parches the throat, heat scorches the body, and the excruciating pain has set every nerve raw and on end. Can you feel it? But we would do well this afternoon to note the varied types of watchers, onlookers at the cross. The wandering watch of the angels who unsheathed their swords from the scabbards when he asked his father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But fell back in regimental relay 
when he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. See the jealous watch of his enemies. See the anxious watch of the women. But zoom the camera in and move from photo on your phone to portrait and see the careless watch of the soldiers. These rude men who gamble for his garments had doubtless joined with their comrades in the coarse mockery which preceded the sad procession up Calvary's hill. From their vapid expressions, there is telling and testimony that it is possible to look at Jesus suffering on the cross and see nothing. They were unmoved witnesses of God manifest in the flesh. Dying on the cross for the whole world, even for them, and they were unmoved. Their ignorance made them blind. And in that circumstance, God calls upon himself to count, but weigh their sins against them. Many of these rude legionnaires gazed for hours on what has touched the world ever since and saw nothing but a dying provincial. They looked on the denouement, the climax, the working out of a purpose hid in God's heart before Adam's creation before the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. A lamb was slain from the foundation of the world and they saw nothing but another execution. They were close to the cross but far from the blood. And the garment which once a poor, haggard, and timid woman at the end of her resources touched and was made whole. These soldiers gambled for it and they won the garment without the Christ. There's something tragically pathetic. There's something tragically pathetic about seeing only something to gain when God is passing by in regal splendor. Shooting dice for such low stakes when Christ is dispensing grace from his precious bleeding side. Brothers and sisters, sadly, Many of us in this church today move among the sanctities of God's dealing with us and are untouched and unimpressed. Prayer does not touch us. Hymns of faith and praise leave us cold and indifferent. The preaching of God's word is boring. And even the cross, the emblem of God's redeeming love, the last sign of determined grace does not even shake us. We play marbles with diamonds and we are close to the cross but far from the blood. On this Good Friday, I would encourage these soldiers and us 
to take another glance. This time, take a perceptive and open-spirited glance and see God in Christ at his grandest. See God engaged in the greatest demonstration of love of which his heart could conceive. John Calvin, Pastor Cosby, a pastor and reformer in the Protestant Reformation, an author of the classic, The Institutes of Christian Religion, wrote that there is no tribunal so magnificent, no throne so stately, no show of triumph so distinguished, no chalice so elevated as the gallows on which Christ subdued death and the devil and trodden them under his feet. H. Richard Niebuhr, one of the most important Christian theological ethicists of the 20th century, said that people want to hear about a God without wrath who brings people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. Can I run that by you one more time? People want a God without wrath who brings people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. But I declare this afternoon, away with this decaffeinated Christianity. No more of this Jesus light. Like Miller light. Great taste. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Less filling. Enough of this 90 pound Jesus. Enough of this name it and claim it counterfeit foolishness. A cross less Christ is secular humanism. A Christless cross is impersonal idealism. But Christ on the cross is the power of God under salvation. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing, but living he loved me. Dying he saved. Buried he carried my sin far away. Rising he justified. Freed me forever. One day he's coming back. Hallelujah. One day he's coming back. One day he's coming back. What a glorious day. I don't need a crossless Christ or a Christless cross. Thank God for Christ dying on the cross. At the cross. At the cross. Where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there. It was there, it was there by faith. I received my sight and now, right now, at 1.21 in the afternoon, right now, I'm happy. I said I'm happy, I'm grateful, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm enthusiastic. I'm for joy. He died in my place.
when you... When you... When, when you gamble... When you gamble at the cross... The stakes are too high. Because if you, if you miss this, you, you, you miss salvation. If you gamble at the cross, you miss atonement. That's, that's not a word we, we hear much anymore. But, but let's explore this, this matter of atonement. That, that's what Jesus was doing on Calvary. Atonement. When Jesus died on the cross, there was an amazing scene in the temple. In the temple, there was a veil of a, a thick curtain that separated the holy of holies from the most holy. And only the high priest could enter the sanctum sanctorum behind the holy of holies once a year on the day of atonement. They would tie a rope around his waist and put bells on the tassels of his robe. And if those bells stopped ringing, they knew he was dead and they could pull him out by that rope because only the high priest could go behind the veil once a year on the Day of Atonement. But one Friday, when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom as if the hand of God had ripped it from the top to the bottom, knocking out forever an intermediary between God and
walked in. But when the frog came in, she let out a blood curdling scream and jumped in my neck and would not turn me loose because she was deathly afraid of that six foot five frog. So I had to come up with another plan. I said, frog, thank you for coming. Here's your money. But she's scared to death. So I went upstairs and got a stuffed animal frog that looked just like the six foot five frog. I gave her the stuffed frog and a smile came over her face because the stuffed frog was the representation of the frog that she was afraid of. Somebody gonna help me talk here. Jesus is God comprehensible. Jesus is God understandable. Jesus is God come down looking like a man so we could understand who God really is. He became what I am that I might become what he is. And in order for me to be saved, in order for me to be at one with him, he had to shed his blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. John Calvin called that the great accommodation. The Greeks called it the kenosis doctrine. The self-emptying of God. God, very God, the eternal now, emptied himself into a body of weakness and contamination. He came to sweat in my heat. He came to shiver in my cold. The event in eternity made his advent in the context of time. Divinity tabernacled in a tenement of clay. God let dust be painted on his spirit. The ancient of days became the infant of days. God who created the heavens and the earth became an embryo in the womb of a peasant girl. He let himself be born. He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in order for God to save us, there must be an atonement. When you gamble at the cross, you miss out on atonement. But as I hurry, when you gamble at the cross, you miss out on substitution. What we cannot do for ourselves, God has done for us in Jesus Christ. On the cross, Jesus carries us through the Holy of Holies into the presence of God himself. Jesus' death is the substitutionary suffering of the son of David that brings appeasement of divine wrath and sets God's people free from the guilt of sin. In the Old Testament, there were bullocks on the altar, rams of consecration, lambs without spot or blemish. And if you couldn't afford a lamb, you could bring a pigeon or, or a turtle dove. But what the blood of animals could have never accomplished, Jesus accomplished once and for all. I'm trying to hurry here, brothers and sisters, but sacrifices had to be made 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the priest never sat down. But one Friday, 
at Calvary. The sacrifice was made once and forever. And you want to know what Jesus is doing right now? He's seated at the right hand of God with power. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's not standing because that would make him a servant. He's not kneeling because that would make him a slave. But he's seated because he's a son. And as the son of God, whenever I sin, the devil goes up before God to accuse me accurately, truthfully, of what I've done. And when the devil brings my sins before God, Jesus stands up at the right hand of power and says to God, I know what he did was wrong, but I paid for that on the cross. I'm trying to hurry. But let me tell some super saint in here. <laughs> let, me, let me tell some of y'all in here who's so holy. You answer your phone, praise the Lord. And you too blessed to be stressed. And you blessed and highly favored. And giving honor to God who's the head of my life to the pastor and officers, members, and visiting friends, if there be any. You got a fish on the back of your bumper, and, and you don't watch television, and you don't put on no makeup, because you're so, listen, that ain't got nothing to do with holiness. That has nothing to do with righteousness. All have sinned and I've come short of the glory of God. And I need somebody in here today who is grateful that God is full of mercy, that God is full of grace, God is full of forgiveness. I did enough yesterday to be in hell today, but he looked beyond my fault. Is there anybody here? I wish I had another crook in here like me who got some decisions you wish you hadn't made, some roads you wish you hadn't traveled. There's some skeletons in your closet that if you open the door, they would fall out right now. But grace, hallelujah, hallelujah, what a savior. I'm testifying now. I said, I'm testifying now. I have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of Terry Anderson. You are looking today at the chief of sinners, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I'm standing here today to tell somebody, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. Though your sins be like crimson, God can wash them like wool. Because somebody in here standing up right now is testifying, if it had not been, I wish I had a witness here. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my, I should have been dead, sleeping in my grave. I should be in the penitentiary right now. But God, it blessed me and brought me to Wheeler Avenue to testify that he died. Didn't he die? He died as my substitute. I'm through. This last word, 
and Reverend Cosby going to pay me. <laughs> and I'm going to Papa Do's <laughs> and get me some crab fingers with fries <laughs> and some refreshment. How your mind got way over that? I was talking about tea. I see some crooks in here like me. When you gamble at the cross, you miss atonement. When you gamble at the cross, when you play marbles with diamonds, you miss substitution. But finally, when you gamble at the cross, you miss the sacrifice of the lamb. I'm through. But on August 16th, 1987, Northwest Airlines Flight 225 crashed just after takeoff from the airport in Detroit, Michigan, killing 155 people. The lone survivor was a four-year-old girl from Tempe, Arizona, named Cecilia. News reports said rescuers did not believe that she had been on the plane. They thought that maybe Cecilia was in one of the cars that the plane hit on the highway and she was the lone survivor of the plane hitting a car on the interstate. Yet when they checked the flight manifest, there was Cecilia's name. She survived because as the plane was falling, her mother, Paula, got on her knees after unbuckling her seatbelt, wrapped her arms around Cecilia and would not let her go. And when the plane fell, crashed after takeoff, the only survivor was Cecilia because her mother got on her knees and covered her. There was blood on Cecilia and they thought she was dead until she started to cry. And when she started to cry, they pulled her mother off her, who was herself dead. They picked up that baby, brought her out of the wreckage, and the first thing the news reporter said on television is this baby survived because she was covered by the blood. I'm through. I'm going to my seat now. But the only reason I'm standing in front of you today is because I've been covered by the blood. The reason I holler so much, the reason I raise my hands in the sanctuary, the reason I give God such enthusiastic praise is because I'm covered by the blood. The reason I tell God thank you so much, the reason I'm always shouting so much is because I'm covered by the blood. There might be somebody standing next to you now who think it doesn't take all of that 
You ain't got to carry on like that. You don't have to holler every time the doors of the church open. You ain't got to be waving your hands all the time. Why don't you just try to be quiet sometime? You ain't got to do all of that. It don't take all of that. The next time somebody looks at you funny, when you're giving God praise. The next time somebody's trying to make you sit down, when you're telling God thank you. The next time somebody's trying to shake you down and tell you it don't take all of that. Why don't you do me a favor and tell them it don't take all that for you, but speak for yourself. You don't know what the Lord, yeah. You can't tell it what the Lord has done for me. If the Lord opened doors for you, Praising me. If the Lord made a way for you, tell God thank you. If the Lord forgave your sins, washed you in his blood, tell God thank you. If you're not too sophisticated, if you're not too mean today, if he's made a way for you, if he answered your prayer, if he dried your tears, if he made your enemy your footstool, if he put food on your table, clothes on your back, money in your pocket, why don't you take a minute right now and tell your neighbor, excuse me, I got a reason to shout right now, excuse me, I have a responsibility to tell God thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for my mother. Thank you for my father. Thank you that one Friday on a hill called Calvary, he died. Didn't he die? But brighter early, brighter early, Sunday morning, he got up. Do you know he got up? If you're glad today, why don't you grab somebody? Tell them you don't know. Like I do, you can't tell it. Like I can tell it. What the Lord, I know he's all right. I know he's all right. with me. He tells me I am his own and the joy, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Say yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he's all right. You don't mind if I testify. A few years ago, I was in the hospital and the doctors told my family, 
and members of Lily Grove, say whatever you need to say. He'll be dead in two hours. That was 13 years ago. Here I am today at the Wheeler Avenue Church testifying right now. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. And then the doctor said, if he lives, you're gonna have to put him in a nursing home. He will be a vegetable for the rest of his life. Here I am, clothed and in my right mind. He's a healer. He's a way maker. He's a burden bearer. He's a problem solver. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? I know he's all right. Make sure that you never live your life too far from the blood. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be ashamed to be close to the cross, but far from the blood. Pastor Anderson just preached to us a word that reminds us of what happened at the cross. 
and what happens for those of us who are covered by the blood. Somebody ought to thank God for the blood of Jesus this afternoon. We're headed to the table of the Lord. But before we get there, somebody may need to know about this Jesus about whom Pastor has preached. We're headed to the table, but somebody may need to know that that Jesus about whom Pastor just preached died for you. His atonement was for you. His substitution was for you. His sacrifice was for you. If you're here on this Friday afternoon, this good Friday afternoon, you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ now that I know what happened at the cross and now that I know the significance of the blood. Hudson's come stand with me now and as they stand with me, somebody around the church may need to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. May need to give your life to him and live for him for the rest of your days. Somebody's coming already. You ought to thank God for them as they walk. Who else may need to come? If you're in the balcony, make your way downstairs. If you're on this first floor, come toward us even right now. This invitation is for you. This invitation is for you. I thank God. Is there another for the blood? That came streaming down for me. Is there another? It was, it was, it was the blood. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here on this Friday afternoon and you say, Pastor, I need to be covered by the blood. I need to be saved by the sacrifice of Jesus. I thank God. Baptist Church this afternoon. Come on, church, and celebrate our dear one who has come this day. Whenever anyone gives his or her life to Jesus Christ, it is my estimation and the estimation of many around us that that's the best decision you will ever make in your entire life. We're so happy for you, so proud of you, and we cannot wait to see what you're going to do for the glory of God. And how God is going to make such a difference in your life as you continue to grow in Christ and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. Welcome to your new family. We are glad you're here. Church, will you help me celebrate our new beloved daughter and sister and friend? Follow Deacon Hudson, will you please? And as you follow him, the team will share some information with you about, in, about new member orientation and the like. Aren't you glad that Pastor Terry Keith Anderson came to church today? <laughs> thank you pastor thank you for blessing us with such a rich word a strong word a substantive word oftentimes we can be so quick simply to say he died that we don't recognize the profundity 
of that death on that cross on that day but pastor anderson has reminded us it was a death of atonement and substitution and sacrifice and we never ought play so much with marbles that we miss the diamonds that are among us thank you sir god bless you will you join us at the table please to god be the glory to god be the glory can we keep singing that i thank god for the blood i thank god for the blood sing beloved i thank god for the blood come leaders come that came streaming down it was the blood that made the difference we stand around the church now to remind ourselves of what happened in that upper room on the night before the Lord Jesus was crucified. He took bread and wine from the Passover meal, reminding us that the bread would represent his broken body and the wine is shed blood. One of those gospel writers said that Jesus looked at those disciples and said, divide it among yourselves. For in that moment of fellowship, communion, they were now to remember that from the Passover came a whole other sacrifice. And that sacrifice would atone for the sins of all humanity. So as we come to this table this afternoon, we remember, even as Jesus compelled us to remember, to do this in remembrance of him. We eat of the bread, we drink of the cup, and we do so because we recognize that what Jesus did for us is far beyond what anyone else would do so we might maintain relationship with him and with our God. In that upper room on that evening, Jesus consecrated those elements and so too shall we in this room on this afternoon. And as we pray this prayer of consecration, won't you ask the Lord to show you in those spaces and places where you're too far from him so that you might be brought back in close to the cross maybe but too far from the blood ask the lord to bring you back to that place where you might maintain genuine fellowship with him especially during this very significant week in the life of the believer our chairman is going to pray a prayer of consecration over these elements and those who have not received their elements will receive them as we sing and prepare ourselves for the reception of this bread and this wine. Chairman Hicks, won't you pray, even at this time? Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather in this place to remember the sacrifice, the suffering, even the shame of Jesus' death. God, we thank you that you didn't gamble with our salvation. Father God, but you paid the high price when you sent yourself in the form of Jesus to die so that we might have life everlasting and abundant. We thank you, Lord God, for it. We thank you, Lord, that this bread and this wine here on this table represent your broken body and your shed blood. For without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. So we are grateful, Lord God, for the sacrifice, for the high cost you paid, Lord, so that we might have this atonement, this salvation, this deliverance from the sins, Lord. Thank you that you died once for all. Thank you, Lord, for the blood that still covers us, still cleanses us, that even washes away all our sins. Thank you for the blood. Now, Lord, we ask that you bless these elements here before us. Bless the bread that represents Jesus' broken body. We thank, ask you, Lord God, to bless the wine that represents the shed blood. It is all in the name of Jesus we pray with thanksgiving and great expectation for the many things you will continue to do for us. 
Amen. Amen. Most of you received your elements as you came into the Lord's church today. The deacons were serving you as you made your way into the cathedral, but maybe you have not received those elements. If not, won't you just slip up your hand? Our deacons will serve you even now. If you've not received your elements, just slip up your hand. There's some on the front of the, front of the church who need to be served. We're delighted to have Bishop James W. E. Dixon with us today. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you for joining us in worship this afternoon. Let's sing together. Let's sing together. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for what you've done for us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege of fellowship. Thank you for the privilege of communion. Thank you that on this Good Friday, we have reasons to rejoice. 
because your blood made the difference at Calvary. So as we leave from this fellowship, as we leave from this worship, as we leave from this place where we've experienced your presence, even as we've experienced your people, bless us now and may all that we do for the remainder of this weekend glorify your name. As we get together on Sunday, will you make our celebration of resurrection so amazing that we'll reflect afresh upon the great work that you have done for us through Jesus Christ. Thank you that he didn't stay dead. Yeah, Lord. <laughs> oh, but when we get together Sunday, we're going to celebrate that Jesus got up with all power in his hand. And we thank you for it. We give you the glory that is due unto your name. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus that we pray this prayer with great expectation, great celebration. And all of God's people together shout hallelujah. Let the church say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. Come on, I thank God.